Well, good evening, everyone. Welcome to our Passover celebration. And uh, uh, now we've got a missionary here with us this evening from Jews for Jesus named uh, Dean Cheriker. Now, I, I hope I got that right, Dean. <laughs> and uh, just so excited to see all of you here. Uh, we, uh, as pastors, decided to do this together. And uh, so the Evangelical Pastors Association of 100 Mile welcomes you to this evening. And I'm just going to turn it over to Brother Rick here to open tonight in prayer before we sing a few songs. Yeah, amen. Well, Father, thank you for this time together. Thank you, Lord, for the unity of brothers and sisters in Jesus. Thank you, God, for a time where we can look a little deeper, look a little closer at Passover. Um, thank you for bringing Dean here. It's amazing. Lord, we pray that you'd bless our whole night and you'd be pleased. And we pray, Lord, that as we make much of you, you just scatter your foe <laughs> and that you'd be glorified and that people would hear and know that you're a God who loves them. T tonight and uh, through this community, we pray for a mighty move of your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 So we're going to sing uh, a couple songs that you, I'm sure you all know and then one song that uh, we learned in Israel and some of you know. <laughs> but we'll teach it. So this first one is one that you all know. Open the eyes of my heart. We want to stand together if we can. That's okay. Yeah. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Israel, and I know I won't get the Hebrew real great, 
Um, it's always pressure when you got an actual Israeli Hebrew man here. <laughs> it's called Kadosh. Kadosh means holy. Holy, holy, holy. And um, uh, boy, there's some words in here. Which ones you got? Can, can you have the words up so they can practice? The, so, Kadosh, Kadosh, Kadosh. Holy, holy, holy. Adonai, Elohim, Tzebaot. Right? Is that, yeah. Adonai Elohim Tzevaot. And then it goes into a chorus. Uh, no, uh, the other Hebrew part. Yeah. Asher Heya Vehove Veyavo. Is it it's Haya, right? Haya, Haya, Haya like Haya. karate chop. <laughs> Asher Haya, Haya Vehove Yeavo. And it's holy, 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 our Lord God. Lord of hosts, uh, who was and is and is to come. That's what it is. Okay, we'll, we'll catch it.
10,000 reasons. the Lord together? Yes. All praise be to Jesus. Amen. And um, Brother Dean, would you come? And uh, Dean will present. That's too loud. <laughs> okay. No, this is not the right one. The one that's called CIP. That's the right one. Okay, so it's good to be here with brothers and sisters. I really enjoy it. So my name is Dean Tzareker, and I serve as a full-time missionary with Jews for Jesus in Israel. 
It's an honor to be able to share with you today about Christ and the Passover. The story of Passover is the central narrative of Jewish people. It's a story of redemption. It's my story, but it's also your story. And it also points us to the story of the gospel itself. Now, you may be wondering, what does the gospel have to do with Passover? Passover is Jewish, right? <laughs> well, Jesus was Jewish. And today, as we explore the story of Passover together, I believe that you will experience the story of his death, his resurrection, and the promise of his return. So, in Deuteronomy chapter 16, God commanded the Israelites to eat bread made without yeast for seven days. Passover marks the beginning of a seven-day holiday called the Feast of Unleavened Bread. During this time, Jewish people will eat unleavened bread called matzo. And so... Uh, we have to eat it for straightly seven days, and we eat nothing but matzo. And I'm, I'm really hoping you would be able to come up to this table later and have a closer look on all the different elements, and even try a little piece of matzo yourself. I'm sure you'll say something like, that's actually pretty good. But trust me, after a week of eating nothing but matzo, you'll do anything to put your hands on a bagel. So why no leaven? Well, our ancestor back in Egypt, uh, in their haste to live in Egypt, had to take their bread while it was still flat. And so in ancient bake baking, today we might call it artisanal baking, adding a little piece of fermented dough to a fresh batch will cause it to rise and puff up, which caused the holes in the loaf of breads as well as the taste known as sourdough, right? Um, some biblical authors, use leaven as a symbol for sin, and it's really easy to see why. Just like leaven, a little bit of sin in our life will puff us up with pride and leave our soul empty and full of, uh, full of holes and sour, right? And so at Passover, we remove leaven from our houses. Actually, the wives do, uh, do it, and she does it for th strictly three months, cleaning everything and at the day of Passover, the, the head of the household, the man, would take credit for all the cleaning. <laughs> but in Passover, we clean leaven from our houses as a symbol for removing sin from our lives. The Apostle Paul applies this very ceremony in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, when he charges us to get rid of the old yeast so that you may be a, f a new unleavened batch as you really are. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Once cleansed of leaven... The home is ready for the Passover seder. Seder means order because the, the celebration of Passover follows a specific order of service, which is recorded in this book called the Haggadah, which means the telling. And today we will engage the story of Passover through reading parts from the Haggadah, which you can find in your brochures. I hope you did take them. <laughs> and so we begin. Passover begins with the with the woman of the house lighting the candles. She then recites a very traditional Hebrew prayer, which I'll say it in Hebrew, and I'll ask you <laughs> to read it in English with me and light the candles. Yeah. No, no, don't worry. I have you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, so the blessing is goes like this, okay? This is until here. And your lighter is over there. You forgot it. So the blessing is go like this until she comes here. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam asher kidashanu b'mitzvotav etzivanu lehadlik ner shel yom tov. Amen. Yeah, and say that. You have to sing it as well. That's it. <laughs> Amen. And so I love that the honor of kindling the lights goes to a woman because the Messiah, the light of the world, would be brought into the world through the seed of the woman. As the prophet Isaiah foretold, Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and she shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us, a light to light up the Gentile and the glory of thy people of Israel. Right? And so there are four acts in the Passover drama, which means we will have to fill our cups 
four times and drink from them. Luckily for me, it's uh, only a presentation, so I don't have to get drunk tonight. And so the first cup is called the cup of Kiddush, or cup of sanctification. The second cup, called the cup of uh, plagues. The third cup is the focal point of the entire ceremony, and it's called the cup of uh, redemption. The fourth and final cup is the cup of Hallel, or cup of praise. Now we will go over them. With the first cup, the cup of uh, uh, sanctification, the head of the household offers a blessing for the evening to come. He then recites a blessing over the fruit from the vine, which I'll say it in Hebrew. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam bore pri agafen. Amen. At the Jewish table, we always follow the blessing from, for the fruit from the vine with another, for, from the bread of the earth. But remember, there is no leavened bread tonight, only matzo, right? And so one of the items you can find on a Passover table is called the matzotosh, which, has, which contains three layers of matzo inside of it, okay? Now it's really important for you to remember the next part. The head of the household then take the middle matzo, remember we have three, so he takes the middle matzo, and recite a blessing over the bread of the earth. And it goes like this. Baruch atah Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam hamotzi lechem min haaretz. Amen. He then breaks it in two. And we eat one half of it, and one half we put in white cloth to be hidden and buried so we can eat it later on. This is called the Afikoman, and I know your Hebrew is great, and it's written right there, Afikoman. Afikoman is Greek for that which comes later. Later on, all the children would have to search for it in order for the story to continue to unfold. And so, the Seder has officially begun. The youngest child would come forward and ask for the meaning of Passover. And then he will chant the four traditional questions, which begins like this. Ma nishtana halayla haze mi kol halaylot, she be kol halaylot, anu ochlim chametsu matza, halayla haze, halayla haze kulo matza. Which the English translation goes like this. So why is this night different from all other nights? On all other nights, we eat leavened and unleavened bread. So why on this night we eat only unleavened bread? Those of us who know the story of Passover are obligated to respond to this kid. And so we say, this is because what the Lord has done for me. When he brought me out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, when he redeemed me with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm, when he provided for my family the sacrifice of the Passover lamb. You see, my ancestors were instructed to take a spotless lamb and apply its blood to the doorpost of our homes. Those who obeyed God's command were spared the ravages of the tenth plague, the death of every firstborn son in the land of Egypt. When the Lord saw the blood on the doorpost, death was forced to pass over. That's where we get the name Passover, right? In Hebrew, Pesach. So just like my ancestor had to apply in faith the blood of the lambs to the doorpost of, our, uh, of their homes, each one of us today have to apply in faith the blood of the Messiah to the doorpost of our hearts. The child then continued to ask the three following questions, which now I'll say just in English. So on all other nights, we eat vegetables and herbs of all kind. So why on this night do we eat only bitter herbs? On all other nights, we're not required to dip even once. So why on this night we dip twice? On all other nights, we eat sitting upright or recline. So why on this night do we recline? Passover is more than a story. It's a reenactment. And so at the first Passover, my ancestor had to eat their meal with their staff in their hand and with their sandals on their feet, ready to leave Egypt at a moment's notice. But today, we relax and recline on pillows. You see, in ancient Middle Eastern societies, only the free, only the redeemed could recline at dinner. Each year, every, every Jewish family recreates the Exodus experience. Each, 
generation must taste from them for themselves the bitter oppression of slavery and must long to savor the sweetness of freedom. Now, this is actually from Egypt, where they enslaved and did a calligraphy, calligraphy uh, of slavery to the Israelites. And now, this is a cedar plate and a piece of food which symbolic and representing the experience of redemption is placed in each one of these compartments. Now we will go over them. The first one is called the carpas or greens. It's actually parsley. Now the greens represent life, but before we could eat them, we have to dip them in salt waters, which represent the tears of life. And by dipping, we are reminded that life without redemption is life drowned in tears. The second item is called the chazeret, the root of a bitter herb. An onion or a horseradish is used, and that represents the, that the root of life is bitter, as it was, certainly was for my ancestor back in Egypt. The third item on this list called the maror. Now, this is the... Uh, the bitter herb itself, a freshly ground horseradish. Now, we're supposed to eat a full teaspoon of horseradish. You know what happened to you when you eat a full teaspoon of horseradish? By the laughter I get you, you understand. You cry, and together with the chazeret, the maror brings to our mind how sad life is without redemption. By way of contrast, we have the charoset which represent the mortar our ancestors used when they had to make bricks for Pharaoh. And it's made up of chopped apple, uh, raisins, nuts, honey, and cinnamon. And it's delicious. Now, you might ask yourself why such a sweet mixture is used to symbolize life of slavery, right? Well, the rabbis explain that even the most difficult and hard circumstances in our life are sweetened upon uh, knowing of a future redemption. The last two items on this list were added to the seder after 70 AD, after the destruction of the temple. And so the first one is the chagiga, or, or egg. A roasted egg is used to represent the temple sacrifices. The chagiga is a token for our grief over the destruction of the temple. And so usually at the seder, it is sliced and given out to be dipped in salt waters, which represent what? That's right, tears. And so the last item is called the zroa. It's a shank bone of a lamb. And it was very hard to bring through the customs here in Canada. I had to, uh, to do a lot to get it here. The, the zroa represents as well the, um, the sacrifices of the temple, right? But since 70 AD, the, the, the temple in Jerusalem was destroyed and no sacrifices are being offered, right? And together with the, the egg, we are uh, doing it as a remembrance of the sacrifices which are no longer being offered. Now, with the presence of the egg and the shank bone, we are forced to ask a very interesting question. With no temple, no altar, and no sacrifices, how is it possible to atone for our sin? Well, the rabbi says that redemption and forgiveness for, uh, of sin is possible through um, prayer and especially good deeds. But the law of Moses um, uh, say that specify that uh, atonement must be made through blood. And so it doesn't make any sense. Our good deed can never save us, right? So in today's Jewish seder, those who doesn't believe in, in Jesus, this question is left unanswered and unresolved. And it's actually sad. We come now to the next, to the next cup, the cup of plagues. Now, in Jewish tradition, a full cup represents a complete joy. But in one sense, our joy is not complete. And so we dip into our cup and let 10 drops fall onto our plate as we recite the 10 plagues that were poured upon the Egyptians. We mourn for their loss and express sorrow over their destruction. Now, there is a very important application for us in this cup. Pharaoh hardens his heart against God's will 
causing pain and even death for those he actually loved. Living in postmodern society, we often believe in the lie that we can defy our own truth and that our personal beliefs are exactly that, personal, right? But in reality, when we do not obey God's leading in our life, the result can be devastating for everyone around us. After the second cup, it's time for the Passover meal itself. Now, there are, very, there are so many Jews around the world, and the dishes may vary around the world. But one thing is always stay the same. We always left a place setting left untouched for the prophet Elijah. Who knows why? I'll say it. <laughs> I'll tell you. Well, it is recorded by the Hebrew prophet Malachi that before the Messiah comes, he will be preceded by the return of Elijah the prophet. And so usually at Passover, a young child will go to the door, open it wildly, hoping the prophet will accept the invitation and come sit at us at our table and announce the coming of the Messiah. When Yeshua or Jesus spoke of his cousin Yohanan or John the Baptist, he said of him, if you care to accept it, he himself is Elijah who was to come. The forerunner has come, and upon seeing Jesus, John declared, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. For us, Christian and Messianic believers in Yeshua, the question of atonement has been answered right, right there. Right? And so, it's time to, 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 to get the third cup, the cup of redemption, the high point of the entire ceremony, right? But we cannot proceed just yet because something is missing. Earlier, something was broken, buried, and now needs to be brought back. This is the time where all the children would have to search for it. And once the afikoman is found, it's returned to the head of the household who must redeem it or buy it back from the child who found it at a small price. When I was in my mandatory service at the IDF in the military of Israel, I found the Afikoman and I granted with a seven day relief from the army. And that was a blessing. <laughs> and so once it returned to the head of the household, he takes it out of the, the, the pouch. He then breaks it and give everybody uh, a small piece to take with the third cup, the cup of redemption. Now, does this look familiar to you? That's right, this is the origin of our communion service. The rabbis taught that the afikoman serve as a symbolic reminder for the Passover um, sacrifice, for the Passover lamb. The lamb that were usually eaten were the, uh, were the temple sacrifices and were the last thing to be eaten on the Passover um, seder meal. At the most famous Passover meal of all time, Jesus took the unleavened bread, broke it and said, this is my body, which is broken for you. And now, the matzo, which is unleavened, represent a sinless nature. Remember? Leaven equals sin. Unleavened, sinless nature. And that we, we can uh, point us to the, to the body of Christ, right? And so, there are very specific regulations set down by our rabbis concerning the preparation of matzo. For example, did you notice it has stripes along it? Now, Jesus had stripes, right? And the prophet Isaiah told, and with his stripes, we are healed. It is also uh, pierced. I know you can't see it right here, but I hope you will come to, lo to look at it later. It has many holes in it. it it's pierced, right? Jesus was pierced, right? And God, speaking through the prophet uh, Zechariah, said, and they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. So, but I see the story of the gospel suggested not only in the matzo and the afikoman, but also in the matzo tosh itself. Remember this three-layered pouch from earlier from which the afikoman is drawn? Now, in today's, uh, in today's uh, Jewish community, there are very big disagreement among our rabbis concerning the meaning of this strange pouch, this three-in-one unit. And so some teach that the Matzotosh represent the three patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. 
But then we have to ask ourselves, why is the middle matzo, which here represents Isaac, is taken away, broken, buried, and then brought back? It makes no sense. <laughs> and because of that, other rabbis teach that the matzotosh represents the three divisions of worship in the ancient kingdom, kingdom of Israel, which are the priests, the Levites, and the people of Israel. And then we have to ask ourselves again, why then is the middle matzo, which in that case represents the Levites, is broken, buried, and then brought back? No sense. The truth is that in today's Jew in Jewish community today, the origin of this tradition has been lost to time. But we have another little known explanation, which has first century root to it. As Jewish believer in Jesus, we realize that we can uh, point us to the, the, the unity that found here. There are three layers here, and yet they form one unity. And as believers in Jesus, we, are, um, we can point us to the, to the unity found in one God revealed himself in three persons. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And now if you ask me, why is the middle matzo is taken away, broken and buried, and then brought back? I believe we can all answer because Jesus was taken away, broken, buried, and then brought back. Amen. Thank you. And so we, we continue. And he was speaking of the third cup, the cup of redemption, that our Messiah said, this is the new covenant in my blood. This is the very new covenant promised to us by God. When he spoke through the prophet Jeremiah, uh, when he said, and I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not the one I made with their father. And I will, write my law, and I will put my law within them and I will write it on their heart. They uh, shall be my people and I will be their God, right? And so... We, we take the pieces of, of, um, of Afikoman together with the third cup, the cup of redemption, as a remembrance of, of the body and blood of the Passover lamb. My Passover lamb is Jesus. Who is yours? Amen. Thank you. And so after the third cup, the cup of redemption, we come to the fourth and final cup, the cup of Hallel or cup of praise. Now, by this time, most of the Jewish people will be tipsy because they have drank four cups of wine. And now, as we drink from this cup, the cup of Hallel or cup of praise, we sing what are known as the Hallel Psalms, Psalms 113 till 118. Now, it may have been one of these Psalms that the disciples sang when we read in the Gospels that after dinner, they sang a hymn, and then they wait, went out into the garden. So this is the seder of pas this is the Passover seder. This, this is the whole thing. And every element here by, its, by itself representing Jesus and points us to the gospel. And today we celebrate and we give thanks to God but, uh, for him to, to free my ancestor from the bondage from the bondage to slavery back in Egypt, right? But as believers in Messiah, we also give thanks for how he uh, freed us from the bondage to slavery to sin, right? And this is what all Passover is all about. And this is what God wants us to, to celebrate and remember and teach the younger generation. This is why the young child would come forward and ask for the meaning of Passover. And those of us who know are obligated to respond. And so this was the Christ in the Passover. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brother Dean. What a beautiful story and how it unfolded. Um, we're just so very thankful. Uh, aren't you thankful to, to see this tonight? Yeah, very good. So we want to bless our brother here too. And um, we're not going to take up an offering collection in the service here. 
but there's a blue box behind uh, the doors here. You'll see it on the wall. If you wanted to designate or give, there's an electronic banking machine there, and just write on an envelope, put the receipt in the envelope for Jews for Jesus. Uh, just designate it to Hillside Community Church and put Jews for Jesus, and then we'll take the offering and make sure it goes directly to Jews for Jesus. So I'd encourage you to give generously tonight. But this is, this is um, a time when we start to look at uh, our Easter celebration, our Good Friday celebration, a time of deep reflection. And as was said, Jesus Christ, our Passover lamb, we're going to be entering into a time of communion. So I'm just going to hand the mic over to Brother Rick, and he's going to uh, speak about the bread. And we're just going to ask the people that we've asked to serve communion to come forward at this time. Thank you, sir. Yeah, and actually, the um, Passover begins on Friday, the same as our Good Friday this year. Passover never changes, our, our calendar does, but we happen to be on the very same. Um, so maybe as, as you, you folks pass this out, the bread, we are using some of the matzah, <laughs> which is really awesome because uh, it's actually hard to get around here, but he brought a whole pile, so that's good. Um, as you do, just um, do you want to pass out the cup as well? Uh, yeah, sure. We're going to use, you know, those little... <laughs> COVID cups for, for the for the drink, because it's there, it's already there. COVID cups, yep. So the sound of wrinkly, wrinkly, wrinkly is all part of worship now. And uh, I, I've been uh, reading through the book of Ruth again, and I uh, just really see there's so much revelation in the book of Ruth, where Ruth is a Moabite, a Gentile, who is, um, uh, you know, marries Naomi's, uh, son and the son dies, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Then anyway, um, Naomi was going back to Bethlehem, which means house of bread, because there was God is blessed Bethlehem. There's bread again because there was a famine before. And Ruth says, "I, I want to go with you." She tried to convince her not to because it was going to be hard, all that. But she said, "No, your God is my God." Your people, my people, I will lodge where you lodge. I will die where you die. And I think it's a really interesting picture of Gentile and Jew together, one new man. Um, I'm just really sort of soaking on that a lot, thinking about that is what we Gentiles need to be saying more. Your God is our God. Your people, our people. We will, we will live with you. We will love you and be one new man together in Yeshua and in Jesus. And uh, I think we haven't done that enough. And so on behalf of Gentiles everywhere, uh, I just want to apologize for that and say we love you, brother, and uh, glad for all the revelation in the Jewish, you know, history that is our big brother. And we recognize and acknowledge that. And when God mentions Jerusalem or some of the scriptures you quoted, he meant it. And we get grafted in. That's, that's the joy of it. We get grafted into this promises of Abraham even because of the broken body and blood of Jesus shed. And so Jesus himself is the bread of life and born in the bread house, the house of bread, Bethlehem, uh, in, the, in what's called the, I think it's called the bread basket of, of uh, Israel, the, the valley of Jezreel Valley. You know, like right there, and uh, and he is the bread of life, bread of heaven. And as we participate, we remember how he took bread and broke it and blessed it. He said, blessed are you, Lord God, king of the universe, who brings forth bread from the earth. He went through these very same blessings that Dean has shared with us. And I had heard that the last cup was called also the cup of completion. Have you heard that? Um, which was one that he said, I won't drink this again until. So I thought that was very interesting. But yeah. So let's pray and then uh, remember his body broken for us. Mm. How can we say thank you, Lord? 
You went the distance. There were times when you could have called legions of angels. And you didn't. And you chose to set your face like flint to go to Jerusalem to, to take on the cross, to be beaten, to be scourged, to be crucified in our place for our sins. And we recognize your body broken tonight. Lord, we do tonight what they did then, and we try to wrap our minds around you saying, this is my body, which is broken for you. Thank you for your broken body, your pierced body, the stripes you took that we would be fully healed, Lord, whole in your salvation. We thank you in the mighty name of Jesus, the strong Son of God. Amen. Take and eat the body of the Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for your broken body. And at the same Passover meal, you know, the, the Lord had the cup. And I'm sure while he was with his disciples and he was pondering the meal that he was having with them and what it, what it meant, he was thinking about how there is no remission for sin without the shedding of blood. And the penalty of sin is death. And I'm sure when he was looking at his disciples, he was thinking about the path that was before him to Calvary, where he would be beaten and then laid upon the cross and the spikes pounded through his wrists and his ankles. And he'd be hoisted up. And his blood would flow down the cross. And all the while, the ones that were doing it to them, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And the blood of Jesus was spilled. And the Lord caused him to be smitten for us. Just what you saw there on the slide with the, the doorposts of the Israelites where the blood of the Lamb was applied and the death angel passed over the home that had the blood of the Lamb applied. And they were spared from that. What a beautiful picture of redemption. Because those people who had the blood of the Lamb applied over their houses, they were spared from that death. And when Jesus was bleeding on the cross and he was dying for the sins of the world, whoever believes in the name of Jesus Christ and confesses him with their mouth shall be saved. And his death was, was, was completed. He, compl he died so that we wouldn't have to. Theologians said that he died instead of us. He died in our stead. And his blood was shed instead of ours. So when Jesus was looking at his disciples around the Passover table that night, he was looking at them and with love in his eyes was saying, even though I am the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end, I spoke and everything came into being. I choose to give myself for you, my people, because I love you. And I know that there is no other way for you to be forgiven outside of my blood being shed, so I will go instead of you and will be sacrificed as your Passover lamb so that when the blood of Jesus Christ 
is applied to the doorposts of the heart of anyone who believes in him. There is redemption, there is forgiveness, there is cleansing, and it makes us clean a place where God's spirit can dwell. Know you not that you are the temple of the Holy Spirit when you come to believe in Jesus and his blood, shed blood is applied to the doorposts of your heart, to your life. The Holy Spirit comes in and you are a new creation. Thank you, Jesus, for the blood that you shed. Thank you, Jesus, for being our Passover lamb to die in our stead. Thank you, Jesus, for allowing them to mistreat you and to beat you and to lay the stripes across your back and for your blood to spill out. You were pierced for our transgressions. You were bruised for our iniquities. The punishment that you had brought us peace, Lord. By your stripes, we are healed. Lord, all of us as people are like sheep that have gone astray, but you have laid upon Jesus, Jesus, you have laid upon you, you, you have laid upon yourself the iniquity of us all, Lord. You took the burden. You took the stripes. So we thank you for your shed blood. As believers in Jesus, let's partake of the cup this evening in remembrance of the Lamb of God. Amen. Let's partake. Thank you, Jesus.